Uh, hi, I'm Divi. Uh, I work on the CLI team. And today I'll be talking about uh, ops uh, for like the fourth time. Uh, um, but yeah, I guess this talk will be public, so I will be a bit more verbose and uh, mention some very um, obvious things that some of us might know. Uh, so yeah. What are ops? Uh, ops are um, like syscalls in an operating system. They get to request uh, the actual OS um, from JavaScript. So JavaScript by default is very sandboxed. Uh, there's no way to call into the file system. There's no way to um, like do network. Either way to call out of JavaScript. Um, and this is where runtimes like Dino um, will provide these APIs uh, in their namespace, like Dino.read file. Uh, and for them to work, we need an interface um, that bridges JavaScript and the native language. So, um, yeah. Uh, why is it called OP2? Well, because um, we have been working on a bunch of um, different versions of how to basically do the same thing. But um, so back in 2019, it was SERDA JSON. We used to just pass JSON back and forth, Rust and JS. Uh, then 2020 came SERDA V8, where we made it a bit faster by serializing V8 and Rust directly, mm -hmm. um, from directly. Uh, then in 2023, uh, the op macro was introduced, which uh, enabled a bunch of uh, other um, performance improvements and optimizations. And uh, this year, op2 was introduced, um, which just redesigned the system, made it more uh, like, like optimization friendly. You can do a bunch of uh, extra stuff with it, and it's a bit more verbose. Um, and yeah. Uh, the whole thing with op macro is that it enables you to express V8 bindings um, with the Rust type system in a mostly safe way. Um, there are multiple types of uh, ops, um, the synchronous and asynchronous. So let's say, for example, you want to implement dino.read file uh, and you want it to be happening in parallel to the other task running on the runtime, then you might want to use asynchronous. If you want dino.read file sync, uh, so you want to block the thread, you want it to be synchronous. Uh, there are multiple subtypes uh, that depend on what kind of operation you're doing, uh, and there are some constraints to them. So there's fast, fast calls in synchronous and slow or generic calls in synchronous. Uh, in asynchronous, there is the auto mode, deferred mode, and lazy mode. We'll uh, see a few examples in later slides. Yeah, so the first example is of the most uh, basic mode, that is synchronous and returning a survey V8 struct. Uh, so this is probably the most uh, like easiest way to write an op um, if you don't care about performance. Uh, so here we have a struct uh, CPU info that returns like frequency in I IRQ. And you have this function that will be exposed to JavaScript. And you essentially put this op2 macro on top of the function. Uh, and yeah, it will just magically do the stuff for you. And in JS, you'll get a JSON or a JavaScript object with frequency and IRQ set. Um, and this survey type here basically tells op2 that, hey, this struct right there needs to be serialized using survey uh, V8. Um, and this is how it's used. So you import the op, and then this is what's being uh, exported to the user, so dino.cpu info. And then you just call the op directly. You don't have to really do anything. Um, so, well, this works, but it's not really the fastest way to do it. So if we 
um, look at the struct. Um, it had two IRQ and frequency fields. To serialize the whole thing, it has to also serialize the fields, which is which are strings and they are costly to serialize. So there is a better way to do this. And this is where fast calls come in. Uh, fast calls are kind of a subset of uh, slow calls. Like they allow a bunch of parameters where V8 can optimize them uh, based on the type and usage. Um, so for example, buffers qualify uh, for fast ops. Um, and in the case of CPU info, we know that we are going to have two numbers, two U32s that we're going to pass to JS. So we can pre-allocate them in JS and then pass them to this um, op and just initialize them right here uh, in the buffer. And, um, or, and we specify fast, so it will be using fast calls. And uh, yeah, it gets a bit more complicated in JS, but essentially you initialize the buffer here, which is outside of the function, not in the hot path. You give the buffer and then you manually uh, extract out the frequency and IRQ value. Um, and this is much faster because V8 knows a bunch of stuff about this object now, it knows the shape, so it can optimize it better. Um, and passing buffers uh, on the fast call is much faster than 30 V8. So this is um, fast calls. Now, let's say you want to um, return an error. Let's say you know you want to read CPUs and uh, the OS won't let you. In that case, you might want to return a result back. And um, you can just use it like normal Rust results, where the result is the error is in any error. And Dino Core provides these utilities like type error, custom error, um, syntax error stuff that you can pass your message to and just return it from the op. And this will automatically throw in JavaScript. Um, so you don't really have to do anything and the usage will mostly stay the same. Uh, then we have permissions. Uh, so now we have a CPU info. API exposed, but Dino provides inverse permissions. So we want to uh, take advantage of that. Um, and to, to use permissions, it's pretty simple. You just get the permissions container out of the op state. The op state is a global state uh, provided to the to op ops in the runtime. And uh, yeah, you can just boil the container and just do a check sys uh, on CPU info, which is going to check if allow sys was specified um, when running this. And yeah, this question mark will basically throw the error back if it's not allowed. And that's how you do permission checks. Uh, uh, okay, so we looked at examples where there was no state involved, like it was stateless, just one off calls into Rust. Um, for some cases, you might want to use resources, which are a way to uh, be more stateful um, and like store a bunch of information while, uh, for example, there's uh, the hasher um, struct, which stores the uh, SHA-256 state for you, and then you create the new SHA-256 and store it in the resource table. Um, so resources are just, any Rust struct or an Al Rust that will be tracked by JavaScript using numbers. So every time you add a new resource, you get a number back, and you just return that to 32 there. Um, and of course, this is fast, so it's fast on top of it. And yeah, you just let's say this is the API you want to expose to your users. The so new hasher will get the resource ID. Uh, from the op, and yeah, you update. You have a bunch of other ops that can like, update on the resource and like close them. Um, so yeah, that's how you do stateful resource with resources. There are another type of resource called um, garbage collected. So the previous example, you had to manually close the resource because. Um, because they are not tracked by the GC in any way. So the user would have to manually close the uh, hasher 
construct uh, the class to uh, get rid of the allocation. But we now have uh, garbage collectible resources powered by CPPGC, also oil pan, which is V8's uh, garbage collector. And essentially, we can just give it the allocation, so our hashed struct, and it will just get take care of like deallocating it. Uh, so it's basically the same thing. Instead of putting your uh, hash struct into this op state, you return it, and this CPVGC uh, attribute on top of the function will let it know that okay, this is now going to be garbage collected. And then you don't need to call close from JavaScript. It will just automatically deallocate the whole thing if it's not used. Uh, another example is uh, async. So yeah, for example, you want to read a file and you want to use Tokyo FS read file, which is an async function. Uh, ops can be async. So you just put that attribute on top and uh, async fn blah, blah, uh, path string and return a string back. And it will automatically return a promise in JS it will do all the event loop stuff in the JS runtime uh, to drive the future, Rust future, and return the result promise uh, back JS. And it's pretty simple to use. So we just do an await on the op. Uh, the other type is lazy async. Uh, well, sometimes you don't want to, well, let me frame it this way. So for the previous example, the um, async task would be polled right after you return them. This is a useful optimization when um, you have a task that might complete the first time you poll it. So we have fast path, which just immediately returns, and that's useful for some cases. Sometimes you don't want to do that. So we have the lazy option, which will not poll it, to wait um, in the next event loop cycle to try to call the future. And so, for example, timers are a good example. You know timer of greater than one or zero MS won't complete the first time. So you just put a lazy on top, and now it's literally called uh, on the next event. Um, the other example of uh, async types is in ops, it's uh, deferred which will um, like try to complete the task, but wait on resolving the promise in JS. This is kind of a weird thing, only used when the spec uh, in a web API might like, require it. For example, WebSocket, the web API requires that send uh, resolves, or like actually sends the buffer uh, in the next stick. Uh, but you might want to still do that for performance reasons, and then actually resolve the promise later to satisfy the spec requirement. So that's when you just put the deferred thing on top that will defer to the actual promise resolution. Uh, the other uh, type of, uh, not type, like other example of uh, how ops could be used is when you want to do events. Um, so you might have noticed ops do not have a way to call back into JS. So then how do you do stuff like watch file or HTTP server, like you know, the server has a callback, how do you do that? Um, so we have uh, a different model than calling into JS because we try to avoid that. Um, so essentially you create, for example, this is a, a watch file example. So you create a new file watcher and uh, yeah, we have a new DC resource that we give back to JS. Now in JS, we will call this poll function in a loop, and this is an async function, and this will basically return the events back um, like an async iterator does in uh, JS. So this is how the usage would look. Um, so you have watch file, and that's a generator function, sorry. Um, up, you create a new watcher, and then you run the yield await uh, for the whole watcher until it's um, yeah forever. And yeah, this will return a new generator back. 
and the user can then do for await on the watch file and it will get new uh, watch file uh, like events back. Uh, mm -hmm. This is how a uh, WebSocket works, the WebSocket server. And yeah, anything that basically has events in it is how it would be working right now. Um, while writing ops is uh, great, we also want a way to debug them and know that okay, we have a bunch of types. How do we know we're hitting the fast path, slow path, async stuff, and like the async stuff is completing. Uh, for that, we have the strace ops option that you can uh, pass via uh, the command line flag. And for example, here's the HTTP server. You can see a bunch of ops executing, dispatched, completed, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, it's cool for debugging to know if something completed or not, if something hanging. Uh, yeah, debug that. Um, we are thinking of ways to write to use this op uh, infrastructure to write more complex things. You might have noticed that all of this requires us to have some sort of JS wrapper around, um, and that adds up to the binary size and start of performance because it adds up in the V8 snapshot, which is uh, slower to deserialize. And we are thinking of ways to, in the future, implement complex API entirely in Rust. So this is like a pseudocode of how it might look like. Like, you know, URL API, you put up to a start constructor, and it just works. Um, so yeah, we're still thinking about ways to uh, practically do this, but yeah, uh, stay tuned. Uh, yeah, thanks. Any questions?